Six Flags America in Bowie, Maryland has a reputation as one of the worst parks in the Six Flags chain. But is that really fair? Based on my first visit in 2012, I think so. However, my most recent visits in 2020 and 2021 have been much different. And I would now go to say that Six Flags America is the most underrated park in the entire chain. So in this video, I will review Six Flags America and explain why this park should no longer be overlooked. Part of the reason for the park's rocky reputation is its tumultuous history. The park traces its roots back to 1974. The park originally opened as the Largo Wildlife Preserve, featuring a drive through animal safari. The park was sold in 1978 to Jim Fowler, the host of Wild Kingdom, who renamed the park Wild Country. But the park continued to be unprofitable. The park was again sold and rebranded as Wild World in 1982. The new owners started adding some amusement rides and water slides to complement the safari, which started to improve the park's fortunes. In 1983, some additional rides were added, but the biggest change was that the drive through safari was replaced by a train that traveled through the animal area, and this is the same train that operates today at the park as Capitol Railways. But the park received a major facelift for 1984. The park decided to transform primarily into a water park. This saw many of the amusement rides removed, and more tragically, the animals were removed as well. It's crazy to think that this park once had a safari similar to the one at Six Flags Great Adventure, but it's doubtful Six Flags America would be the thrill park it is today if it still had the safari, but more on that in a bit. 1985 saw the owners revert back to being a hybrid amusement and water park. The park wanted a signature coaster but they did not have the funds to build a flashy new wooden coaster. But after seeing the success the Knobles had relocating and rebuilding Phoenix, Wild World decided to relocate the giant coaster from the recently closed Paragon Park in Hull, Massachusetts. This coaster was renamed the Wild One, and it's still one of the park's best attractions to this very day. The park had some financial issues by 1990, and it was put up for sale again. In 1992, Wild World was purchased by the Tierco Group, who would later become Premier Parks, and the park would be renamed Adventure World. This began the park's transformation into the thrill park it is today. From 1993 to 1998, the park received four roller coasters, a drop tower, the ill-fated Typhoon Sea Coaster, and a water park renovation. Then in 1999, the park was renamed Six Flags America, and the rapid expansion continued. The park was doubled in size. Wild One originally ran along the back perimeter of the park, but an all-new Gotham City area was added behind it. Five new coasters were added over the next three years, including the park's three most popular steel coasters in Joker's Jinx, Superman Ride of Steel, and Batwing. And as evidenced by these names, the park started to use Six Flags' brands, including DC Comics and Looney Tunes. Six Flags America seemed poised to become one of the region's best parks. But then the rapid expansion stopped. At the same time, the park started developing a bad reputation. While the park had a really impressive ride lineup, the park had a series of self-inflicted wounds that held itself back. Rides had frequent downtime, if they even opened. Many said the staff was unfriendly and inefficient, and the park looked ugly and neglected, particularly in the barren back half of the park. Combine that with the fact you have some of the most highly regarded parks in the United States nearby, such as Busch Gardens Williamsburg, Six Flags Great Adventure, and Hershey Park, Six Flags America's attendance did not grow like Six Flags expected, and the park started to fall into a state of neglect. And that's stunning considering how Six Flags America had so much potential. It was in a highly populated area near Washington DC and Baltimore, it had oodles of land, and it already had a strong ride lineup. But is there light at the end of the tunnel? In my most recent visits in 2020 and 2021, I left the park very impressed. Six Flags America is often criticized for its appearance, and to be honest, I have always loved the front half of the park. 
the Main Street area feels like a colonial take on Disneyland's classic Main Street, with the setup and the architecture. Chesapeake feels like a subtle continuation of this while adding in some rides. The Coyote Creek Western area is great with all those western facades. The Mardi Gras area, which was added in 2014, feels like a party with the electric music. And the Looney Tunes Movie Town area is a colorful and fairly well shaded kitty area. Now, the back half of the park has never looked great. It feels like one of those scenarios in Roller Coaster Tycoon where you just plop down a bunch of pre built layouts in a giant field, and then you're too lazy to do anything else. You build dead-end pathways, and then you don't bother adding trees, restrooms, and food stands. These are still issues, but they're slowly being worked on. A bathroom was added over by Superman. The new Harley Quinn Spin Sanity Giant Frisbee was accompanied by a new food stand. And the Whistle Stop Park Kids area really helped liven up the back half of the park, and give kids a reason to even go back there. The one area that still has not been fixed that really needs something is that long walk between Superman and Batwing. It is a long, dead-end pathway with absolutely nothing along the way. Outside of some cardboard cutouts of Batman heroes and villains, there are no additional rides, shops, or restaurants on this pathway. You just have a few vending machines and Batwing. Beyond some general aesthetic improvements, a few flat rides back here would really help the overall balance of the park. The park staff was significantly better in my most recent visits. A good chunk of the ride attendants were outgoing and very friendly. And in 2021, I noticed a major focus on efficiency across the park. Lines have never been much of an issue with this park. Outside of Saturdays during Fright Fest, most things seem to be walk-ons at this park. The park just doesn't see the same crowds as the other Six Flags parks. So the park could get away with the one train operations and slow dispatches, despite being a frustration for guests. But in 2020 and 2021, I noticed that most coasters were running multiple trains. And especially in 2021, ride attendants were absolutely hustling to dispatch trains. The crew working Batwing was the biggest improvement. In the past, it was not uncommon to see that ride have 5 to 10 minute dispatches. But this year, they were dispatching trains in 30 to 60 seconds. That is unbelievable for a Vacoma Flying Dutchman. The ride leads were also encouraging crews to have the next train ready before the prior one hit the brake run, and the staff was working hard to meet that demand. Food lines can be combated by mobile ordering, which has worked flawlessly over the past two years at any Six Flags park I've used it. And speaking of food, it's pretty average for a Six Flags park with the usual burgers, chicken tenders, pizza, and snacks. The food is quite pricey if you don't have a meal plan. Uptime has also become less of an issue for the rides. In my first visit to the park, Superman was closed all day, which was a major buzzkill, and ride closures seemed to follow me wherever I went that day. In my most recent visits, everything has been open consistently outside of the water rides, which were understandably closed for the season, and Batwing, which has opened late in each of my visits. I always seem to see maintenance over there working on Batwing, so the park is clearly trying. Because of this ride's uptime, I would recommend prioritizing Batwing once you see it running. If the general improvements to the back half of the park and operational improvements continue, I suspect more people will start to see Six Flags America in a rosier light, and hopefully the park's attendance will jump as a reward. Moving on to the ride lineup, the park has a very balanced coaster lineup. There really is a coaster for everyone's tastes. As a headliner, you have Superman Ride of Steel, one of the earliest intimate hyper coasters. This coaster doesn't have the strongest pacing, but it has some fantastic elements, such as the first drop, camelbacks, and bunny hills. There is no shortage of ejector airtime on this ride. And the ride has a wonderful setting that goes out into the woods. I have a separate review that goes into more detail but this alone is a good reason to visit Six Flags America. I actually may prefer Wild One though. This wood coaster is over 100 years old, but it runs far smoother than you'd expect if you avoid a wheel seat. I strongly recommend riding this one in the front row. Not only is that the smoothest seat, but the coaster has some fantastic airtime up there, both floater and ejector pops. 
Plus, that final helix has some of the best sustained laterals of any coaster. I admittedly am nostalgic for this ride since my childhood home was just 15 minutes from the ride's original location, and this is another ride that I have a separate review on. The other wood coaster is shakier and roar. This is one of the earliest GCIs, and as a result, it runs with PTC trains as opposed to the Millennium Flyers you find in their later rides, so the ride doesn't track as well. Up front, it's rideable, but it's extremely bumpy on a wheel seat, especially if you go further back in the train. I do enjoy this coaster's twisted layout though up front, and while the ride does feel a bit slow, it does offer a few pops of airtime and some really rare positive G's for a wood coaster. But the roughest ride in the whole park is undoubtedly Mind Eraser. This Vacoma SLC will bash your skull into oblivion. I rode it in my first trip to the park and will never ride it again unless it gets new trains. Ride this one at your own risk. Firebird is one of two Six Flags Great America hand-me-downs. I guess you could say Great America gives their not so great rides to America. This was B&M's first stand-up coaster, and first coaster in general. It opened as Iron Wolf at Six Flags Great America, and was renamed as Apocalypse in 2012 when it came to Maryland. And this coaster was quite violent. Then in 2019, the coaster was transformed into Firebird and received floorless trains. The ride is still very shaky up front, but I actually enjoy it in the back row. There's just one really bad transition after the corkscrew, but outside of that, the coaster has some mild forces and a unique layout. The other Great America hand-me-down is Ragin' Cajun. This spinning coaster routinely is the longest line in the park due to its capacity and status as the park's only real family coaster. While the layout has been cloned several times, this Revershawn spinner is notorious for being more dizzying than the others. Joker's Jinx is the park's lone launch coaster. While the launch in this Premier Rides coaster may not be as strong as some others out there, the Twisted Spaghetti Bowl layout offers some good positive G's and whip. Batwing is one of two remaining Vacoma Flying Dutchmen. The sections where you're on your back can be a tad bumpy, but the rest of the ride is a very forceful barrage of overbanks and inversions. I go into more detail in a separate review, but this coaster was one of the first large-scale flying coasters, and I think the layout is superior to the original B&M Flyers. Last but not least, you have the Great Chase Kitty Coaster. In a note to enthusiasts, I was denied this credit in my first two visits to the park, but I had no trouble getting it in 2020. Others have not seemed to have the same issues as me getting this one over the years, so maybe I was just unlucky. The two kids areas in general have a large collection of rides for younger guests. I think the Looney Tunes area is the far better of the two in terms of the overall atmosphere. It's more lively and actually has some shade, unlike Whistle Stop Park. For flat rides, you have several older ones in the front half of the park. You have spinning rides and pendulum rides. In the back half of the park, you have the park's newer flat rides and also their better flat rides. Wonder Woman Lasso of Truth is the park's tallest attraction, and the Star Flyer gives great aerial views. Harley Quinn Spinsanity has yet to open, but this Zamperla Giant Discovery should offer a great sense of speed and some good sustained floater airtime like the other ones in the chain. But my favorite flat ride is the Voodoo Drop Intamin Drop Tower. While it's among the shorter drop towers out there at just 140 feet or 43 meters tall, this drop tower packs a mighty punch with some good float and stomach dropping the whole way down. And then you have a trio of water rides. Shipwreck Falls is a soaking shoot the chute ride. Renegade Rapids is a fun river rapids ride through the woods. And Penguin's Blizzard River is a very rare Whitewater West spinning rapids ride. You can also see some of the remnants of the Skull Mountain Log Flume ride over by Wild One, but that ride is long gone. Six Flags America also has a decent water park in Hurricane Harbor. It is included with admission, and while none of the slides are standouts, the slide lineup does cover all genres in terms of tube slides, body slides, speed slides, and specialty slides. Plus, you have some of the other amenities like children's play areas, lazy rivers, and wave pools. Like the other Six Flags parks, this one also has seasonal events. Fright Fest is the more popular of the two big ones. 
the event gets particularly busy on Saturday nights. I visited in 2020 and in lieu of the haunted houses, the park repurposed their train ride as Reaper Railways, which was a really unique haunted train ride. I hope this continues in future years because this was a much more memorable experience than the short haunted houses you find at most Six Flags parks for the event. Holiday in the Park is one they have not visited at Six Flags America, but it appears to use the front half of the park, and if it's like the other Christmas events in the chain, this one is sure to have dazzling lights displays all over the park. So do I recommend Six Flags America? I still think the other mega parks in the area are better, but Six Flags America is now a good park. It has a great ride lineup, improving customer service, and there's something nice knowing you can visit a major thrill park like this and not have to deal with hour-long waits. And if the park happens to be busy, there is always the Flash Pass Skip the Line service. I would not hesitate to include this park on any East Coast coaster trip itinerary, and if you're local to the Washington DC area, I think it's worth investing in a season pass for this park. If you have not been in several years, I strongly recommend giving Six Flags America another shot like I did. Now I would say that Six Flags America is the Six Flags equivalent of Dorney Park, especially with the improved operations. Both parks may not get the flashy additions of the other parks in the chain like they once did, but both have above average ride lineups and minimal wait times. That combination would honestly make it a pretty ideal home park in my opinion. So those are my thoughts on Six Flags America, what I now think is the most underrated park in the Six Flags chain. What are your thoughts on Six Flags America? Have you been recently? I would love to hear your thoughts down in the comments. If you enjoyed this review, I'd appreciate if you gave this video a like, and you considered subscribing because there'll be a lot more roller coaster and music park videos here at Canopy Coaster. Thanks for watching.